What is the best way to end a trilogy? Of course, there are plenty of obvious answers when it comes to ending any story, trilogy or not. The core of those answers are always the same thing. It needs to be satisfying enough to make the journey feel worthwhile. When it comes to specifically a trilogy, however, I do think there is an added layer that needs to be considered, and that is to find the best way to mix the tone and sensations of the first two installments in the story. It helps the entire trilogy come together and feel whole. For example, while Return of the Jedi gets teased for just how silly it can get, I do think there is a good balance between the campiness from A New Hope and the more serious philosophical tone from Empire Strikes Back to really make the original Star Wars trilogy feel like one cohesive story, and not just three separate movies. And to me, Batman Arkham Knight does that as well. While it gets harped on for not necessarily adding anything new besides the Batmobile, which you'll know we'll talk about at some point, I think the game overall does a fantastic job wrapping up the story Rocksteady wanted to tell with Batman. Welcome to the finale of The Arkham Files, a kind of funny games mini-series where I, Barrett Courtney, look back at what made each game in the Batman Arkham franchise so special. To wrap it all up, let's take a look at Batman Arkham Knight and how it brought a satisfying conclusion to Rocksteady's Batman. Before we get into the deep stuff, let's take a quick look at the surface of this game and why there was so much conversation around it at release. Something that doesn't get talked about enough is how good this game is on a technical level still to this day. I would argue that it's still one of the best looking games from last gen, all while playing the best in the entire series, except that PC port at launch. With Batman's upgraded suit, Free Flow Combat feels the best it ever has, with a large variety of gadgets at your disposal, and not to mention the myriad of enemy types and locations that make every fight feel unique. And even stealth sections have a really quick and even more satisfying feel to them. From a pure gameplay standpoint, this game truly makes you feel like you're in Batman's prime, despite it being the last night that Bruce wears the cowl. Moment to moment, this game is the most fun to play because of that. Arkham Knight feels more like an open world than its predecessor, with three full islands to explore, an entire wheel full of side missions, enemy tower-like activities, and a bunch of Riddler trophies to collect. But even with all of that, Rocksteady didn't miss a beat and somehow even improved the level of detail they're known for for having. Gotham has never looked this good in a game, from a technical standpoint and even aesthetically. Rocksteady's Gotham finds an interesting balance between Arkham Asylum's classic gothic tone and Arkham City's more modern city feel. To me, it was honestly the first time outside of a comic book that the city of Gotham felt right. In both my Asylum and City videos, I talked about the balance of control and power between Batman and his foes. Asylum leaned heavily towards your enemies having more power, and City leaned the opposite, showing the player two sides of Batman's life. A night where he feels powerless, and a night where he has all of the power. Knight has a lot of the same open world design philosophy from Arkham City that makes you feel like the Dark Knight at peak performance. But then on the story side of things, you always feel one step behind Scarecrow and the Arkham Knight, and and there are even some gameplay instances where you don't feel like the one truly in control. It brings back the feeling so many miss from Arkham Asylum, that you have no real control on how this knight is going to play out, it's all by their design. And I think Knight does a great job of giving you both the design philosophies of Asylum and City. Now let's talk about what shines brightest in this game. Talk about the Batmobile! <sighs> Okay, fine. The Batmobile has both strengths and weaknesses. The major weakness that I do tend to agree with are the stealth fights, which definitely feel forced. They just aren't interesting and are, in my opinion, the lowest parts of the game. Another low point is the Deathstroke boss fight, which should have been another fun hand-to-hand -hand combat scenario, but turns into a reskin of the Cloudburst battle. I'll admit it, that was super disappointing. One weakness people point to that I don't agree with, however, is that there are too many Riddler trophies that need the Batmobile. In this case, I think of the Batmobile as another gadget in Batman's utility belt. Gadgets were almost always necessary for Riddler trophies, and of course the shiny new gadget is going to be showcased a lot in that aspect. I personally think that was fine. On the other hand, I do think the straight-up tank fights that don't rely on stealth are really fun. 
They are arcadey and dumb, but it does remind me a lot of the best parts of free flow combat and how satisfying it can be to finish an encounter with an unbroken combo. The last thing I'll say about the Batmobile before we move on is that I honestly think people focus on it too much when it comes to discussing the overall quality of the game. It has some really fun elements and some not so fun sequences that you need it for. To me, it doesn't make or break the game. The Batmobile is fine, and I think the discussion around it takes focus away from what this game does so damn well. While you can take or leave everything else that comes with Arkham Knight, whether it's the design philosophy or just the Batmobile, the thing that shines brightest in Rocksteady's final chapter of their Arkham trilogy is the story. Many point to the story being a lesser version of Under the Red Hood, since the title character is revealed late in the game to be Jason Todd, but we all saw that one coming, no matter how Rock City tried to play it off. But to me, Arkham Knight isn't actually about the Arkham Knight, and is kind of mistitled for the sake of having a cool name with the word Arkham in it. Each game in this series is subtly and not so subtly about some aspect of fear, and the best way to end Bruce Wayne's story as Batman is a simple one having him truly face his biggest fears. And Rocksteady did that beautifully by having Joker haunt Batman beyond the grave and slowly try to take over his mind. I won't go deep into how Joker was able to do this because honestly it is a lot of comic book mumbo jumbo, but having Joker over Batman's shoulder for almost the entire game creates this very tense buddy cop dynamic and it serves as a constant reminder for Bruce about how he feels guilt over the death of Joker in Arkham City. But it's not just guilt. Batman has a strict no-killing rule, because once he goes down that hole, he has no idea how quickly he could fall down it and turn into people like Harvey Dent, Slade Wilson, or even the Joker. Batman always needs that strict line to not cross, and the entirety of his journey through the events of this game is seeing if that line can be erased now that he feels slightly responsible for Joker's death. A lot of Bruce's fears are usually stemmed from his past failures, dead sidekicks, realizing old friends have lost their way, or even feeling responsible for the death of an enemy. Bruce's biggest fear is that he is one bad day away from becoming the Joker, and that fear manifests into Joker slowly taking over Batman's brain from a mixture of Scarecrow's fear toxin and the leftover Joker blood from Arkham City. And then, Bruce's greatest fear happens when the Joker takes over Bruce's mind. But then we see Joker's biggest fears after getting injected with fear toxin again, and it's the most human fear of all, being forgotten. In the end, Bruce takes back control and reminds himself of the legacy he will actually leave behind and ends up overcoming his greatest fear. The Joker is gone, and he will never become that. He has nothing left to truly fear. A lot of this game is about facing your fears, being consumed by them and overcoming them. And while yeah, there are plot points that either don't make sense or get really over the top, I do think the overall story in Arkham Knight is the best in the series, and that's just because of how much of a deep dive we get into the fears of Batman and Joker. And we have to say goodbye to both of them with such a big emotional punch, with Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy both giving their best performances as these characters they had been voicing for 23 years. There is so much that has been left unsaid, not just about this game, but the series as a whole in these four Batman Arkham videos. I could probably go on for another several hours, and that's because there's just so much to dig deep within each of these games. Thank you for going on this journey with me and letting me talk about specific aspects of each of these games while understanding I couldn't talk about everything about what makes these games so damn good. But for the final episode of The Arkham Files, I want to end with a thought about the true ending of Arkham Knight. Many of us have obsessed over where the Arkham universe went after the supposed death of Bruce Wayne and who the new Batman could be. Did Bruce return? Did Jason follow in his mentor's footsteps? Could Azrael have fulfilled his destiny of donning the cowl? Honestly, the answer doesn't matter. In a world where Bruce Wayne was revealed to be Batman on live television, the legend of Batman is no longer an idea, but only a man. Taking that mask off was a big mistake. Now you're just a man, Bruce. You can't scare anyone anymore. But Gotham always needs a Batman. So what matters most is that Batman has returned and once again has the most important element of being Batman. Criminals in Gotham are a superstitious and cowardly lot, and the one thing they'll always respond to is fear.